you all very much for having me here, for sparing the time to listen to, uh, to the story of my sister, my younger sister, Althea Siddiqui. Uh, I really don't have the words to thank you all. To thank you all for coming over to Pakistan, especially at a time when the safety and security issue is uh, really very, very concerning. And you're still, you're very brave people. And you really, I mean, you're the people that I think keep the world alive. And uh, though my words fail me, I know my God will not. And I hope and pray that his blessings will remain with you always. Um, I'm here today. Um, I am a medical doctor. I trained at Harvard uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I went on to direct the epilepsy program at the Sinai Hospital uh, in Baltimore. And I was an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. And I was the director of the epilepsy program there. And uh, I had three years consecutive and am now, uh, and have sat for the lifelong America's Outstanding Professional Award. Um, with all of that, I was a medical doctor, and uh, till about 10 years ago. Um, but more so, um, 10 years ago, this was in March of 2003, when my little sister, um, a little bit about my family. My father was a physician, a medical doctor. He was with the United Nations WHO, so we spent a lot of time in African countries. My childhood, our childhood, my sister, and I'm five years older than Afia. We're three brothers and sisters. Um, my brother is older, he's in, the, he's in America. Um, he's an architect by profession, and he used to work for NASA for a while, and then now he's, uh, he graduated from Rice University. And then me, I just told you about myself, and then Afia. Uh, who's our youngest, who's the youngest. Um, so we lived in Zambia. My father uh, graduated from uh, England, Macclesfield, Manchester. And uh, that's a little bit of our background. My mother is, was uh, a social worker and a graduate in economics. And uh, so a little background just so that you know where we're coming from. And uh, so in March of 2003, uh, Afia, uh, let me go back a little more, Afia. She was a younger sister. She was the youngest of our family. Very bright, very brilliant. Um, academic career, first class first, throughout. From nursery till her graduation. First class first, straight A student, um, valedictarian. And uh, so when she uh, did her uh, intermediate in uh, from here, uh, that would be high school. Uh, from Pakistan, from St. Joseph's, uh, our parents decided to send her to the US for further, for further education. Um, she went to the University of Houston because my brother was at Rice, and uh, uh, so they could be together. There, she was in the National Dean's List, and she had a full scholarship to MIT. So then she moved on to MIT. And there she graduated in, uh, I think her graduation degree is in biology. And then she went in to do her master's and PhD from Brandeis University, um, again in Boston. And she got married after graduation and did her master's and PhD, and that was in education. She's not a medical doctor, I'm a medical doctor. I'm a neurologist. Uh, and a psychiatrist, and um, I specialize in epilepsy. But Afia was an educationist. And uh, her PhD was on uh, cognitive neuroscience. And uh, her thesis was on, uh, based on how to make learning efficient. How she, her research was on mentally retarded children and how to make them functional members of the society. And education was her dream. And her dream was to bring a change, to bring a change in the education system of Pakistan. She thought that the problems of Pakistan, the main core of the problems and the reason 
is the inefficient education system here. And if it could become cheap, accessible, and quality-oriented, that would make a difference, and that is what she was working on. As a child, she loved dogs. They were her life. They were everything. I mean, my brother, you know how <coughs> brothers and sisters, I think this is something that's universal. It doesn't matter which culture there is, but brothers and sisters, if you have an older brother, if any of you have an older brother, he has to tease his younger sister. And um, that was the same in our case as well. And my brother, you know, seeing Afia's passion for her dolls, all he needed to do if he wants Afia to scream or anything, take a doll, turn her upside down. We're sitting at the table, Afia's here, Everyone's back, he just goes in the back, takes a doll and turns it. And Afia goes on, oh, he's going to kill her, the blood's all going to go in there, and look what he's doing to my doll, my doll's being tortured. And she loved balloons, she loved animals. She, she's been injected twice for the anti-rabies thing, because she would bring rabbit dogs from the street, that, oh, the poor dog is sick. And uh, she created the... The Society for the Promotion of Cru Prevention of Cruelty to Animals here in, Pakistan, in Karachi, the office that was set up, she did because she's like, no one cares for these poor animals. And she, as she grew up, as she got married, as she had children, again, her children were her life. And uh, she volunteered even in the United States at the old people's homes and with autistic tick. Mentally retarded children were another passion of hers, and she volunteered even in the United States, that's what she used to do. Um, but in all of that, I mean, the work that she did, she worked for Bosnian, she worked for Bosnian refugees, she helped with their <coughs> rehabilitation, she did all of that. But my question is, that does that make her a terrorist? Would that not be mission? Would would that not be a missionary work? Would she not be a missionary? And sometimes I ask the question: If she were not a Muslim, maybe that's what they would have called her. But somewhere in the aftermath of 9/11, around 2003, she was married. She had three children at that time. Her youngest, six months old. She she came to Pakistan. And this was about the 30th of March, 2003. She left home. I was in the States. She left home and uh, she, from Karachi was coming here to Islamabad. And uh, she never got to Islamabad. Disappeared, as if she's disappeared from the surface of the earth. My mother was here alone. My father had very recently died. So my mother was in Islam. Uh, there is something that's called idda. Once, you know, when a husband dies, there's a mourning period for the woman. I don't think many of you would have heard of that, but my father had just died in, in uh, September 2002. So my mother had just finished undergoing that mourning period, which is about four months for a woman. It's three menstrual periods, so then, if, you know, it's after menopause, then it's four months, something like that. So, <coughs> anyway, so. All she could do was make phone calls, and she was alone, all alone. And uh, she called the chairman of the Senate. She called the interior minister. She called the, and you know, all the police and everyone came, and you know, they took it as a kidnapping for ransom, and they said, wait for a ransom call. My mother got very upset, and they were like, and the minute she got upset and wanted to make some noise, suddenly there are people at our doorstep, we get, she gets phone calls that keep quiet or four bodies will be at your doorstep. If you raise any voice, four bodies will be at your doorstep. If you talk to anyone, if you complain, you know, all you get is dead bodies. <coughs> and alone, my mom was obviously in a state of panic until suddenly one day, uh, this is way in April, uh, I was doing my rounds and uh, the, the TV in the hospitals, you know, there are TVs there, and, and I see my sister's picture flashing there, and it was uh, MSNBC and Tom Brokaw's show, and he was breaking the news that she's been picked up by the FBI, 
and she's li practically in the hands of the FBI. And uh, you know, they sometimes say like, uh, you know, your legs give way when you get into shock, and you know, it feels like the floor's gone under from underneath. That's how I felt. I mean, you know, those are not just sayings. I actually felt that, and you know, I had to just sit down. Like, that's Zafia, isn't it? Uh, that's not possible. Well, you know, I just tried to compose myself enough to get to my office, and I just sat there, and then I called my brother in Texas, and I said, did you see that? And he said, no, okay, wait, let me get a videotape. So he taped it, and, that, and then we called Pakistan. My mother goes, hush, hush, don't take off his name. She'll die. Like, what do you mean, don't take off his name? It's all over in the media. And, uh, and then she, you know, between that and that, she says. And then so she, you know, we contact the Pakistani officials, the embassy and all, and we are told that she is not with the Pakistani authorities anymore. She has been flown. And that has been reported in the papers uh, of 2003 and 2004 has been flown to the US. So then we hire lawyers in the US and you know we go through all of that. Um, but it's almost as if you know we tried and most of the time we would get the thing that please keep quiet. I was reassured in court under oath by um, an FBI agent, his name that he swore under was Michael Yetter. And he, he said that uh, you know I can assure you she's alive and well. But please just don't get emotional and don't make a hue and cry of that. It's, uh, and you know, they kind of let me believe like it's her husband who's involved in some sin sinister things and she's in a kind of a witness protection kind of thing. And then over here in Pakistan, I mean, my friends and all tell me that look Fazia, she's in American custody. Just be thankful for that, you know. They're more humane than us Pakistanis. <laughs> Okay, now all this that I'm telling you, had you asked me this two years ago, I could not have told you these details because I didn't know. Um, people would say, you know, you're hiding it or that, but there, you have packages, and in these packages there is a booklet. Um, the IGN, uh, there's a small booklet that says, after the DPs, just the facts. Right. Now, that is an investigative report of the International Justice Network, so I won't go into the details, but that has at the, uh, at the back a dialogue that has a dialogue um, of the person, the head of the anti-terrorism task force who abducted Afia. He has finally come out and made the statement that yes, I abducted her. And in 2003, at the behest of the anti-terrorism task force, uh, the dictator that was uh, told to, and when he was asked the question, that what about the children? Why did you not return the children? He said, oh, we took them with us. And when he was asked why, he said, they are the best coercion. What better bargaining chip would we have for a mother than children? When asked, why did you pick her up? He said, her husband had given us the lead, her ex-husband. And it's all in there, so I'm not going to go into the details that are there. Um, and when he further asked them what happened to her, what fate did she, he said that he gave her to the ISI. And what happened after that? the ISI, and then we all know, well, this went on for five years that we didn't know then, but we know now after the investigation. And the role of uh, the intelligence agencies, uh, you know, the FBI reported, the ISI, and all of that. So it's like an alphabet suit of uh, intelligence agencies that are kind of running the whole thing like the windmill of the gods, but whatever. The point is that till 2005, after all of this for two years, it was silence. I mean, I went everywhere, the media, everything. Everything was silent. It was like Afia has disappeared and her children from the face of the earth. Everywhere we went, and then finally we were like, okay, we'll file for dead bodies. When we filed for dead bodies, they said you have to wait seven years. Mm. And so, um, but then just then, Yvonne Ridley, 
um, a British journalist uh, who was captured by the Taliban and uh, then was released and then she embraced Islam but she was there and when she went back and she saw the gram and she, she talked to some people in Guantanamo, she was a do doing a story there and there was Tumi and Muhammad and some Britishers that were held in and they mentioned that you have no idea there's a place much worse than Guantanamo that's in Afghanistan, that's Bagram where we were. And they mentioned Prisoner 650. And then when she dug in, she came, she approached me, um, and your host here, um, who you'll be going out with, uh, Imran Khan, uh, he uh, hosted her as well to do a press conference and the plight of Afia. So um, I'm indebted to him on that. And uh, the Human Rights Corporation of Pakistan, Iqbal Health and yes, the Commission of Pakistan, um, is, uh, Senator Iqbal Heather was the chairperson at that time. He literally grabbed me out and he said, how long are you going to remain silent? I'm like, but they told me, they told me themselves the children are dead. They told me she's dead, there's no way she can be alive. On the glimpse dance, and you should have seen my phone call. I can show you the pictures and all, I'm sorry, the screen and all, it's not working. And uh, the messages and uh, the threats that I will be left without a mother, my children will be left without a mother, um, you know, we live in Karachi. I mean, the threats were phenomenal, um, if I dare to speak out. And my children, my mom, and everything, they, every possible thing they could. So I had a choice. That is when I had a choice, that either to speak out on the plain chance that my sister may still be alive and risk everything that's precious to me or to keep silent. That's when I made the choice, and there are a few <coughs> brave people that I have to thank. Here is one of them, right here. Only woman in thousands of male prisoners, and her screams and her shouts could be heard far and wide. This she was known as the shouting woman of Baghdad because she knew she was the only woman there. And all these male prisoners, and she had to, she couldn't, she had no privacy for her shower, she had no privacy for changing. She had no privacy for sleeping. She was in thousands and thousands of men. And in Afghan society and Pakistani society, this is simply unacceptable. Our culture does not permit this. So she's now in prison in yes. Texas in, in solitary confinement for 86 years. Yes. Um, and yes. uh, so... And, and the so basically what happened... Right. Terrorism. Well, actually the charges on terrorism. Uh, but attacking, she was attacking the US soldier. The, the, the thing soldier. that happened, and you see, so when, when we spoke up, what happened? When I spoke up, what happened? Nothing happened to me. Nothing happened to my children. But what did happen is that Afia was found wandering, a dazed Afia, a battered Afia, was found in Urzmi, Afghanistan, and shot. And we are told by the FBI who knock at my brother's door and say, oh, we found your sister who's been shot in the abdomen twice. And my brother was like, first you come and tell me she's dead, now you're saying she's shot. And then they say, don't you want to know how she is? My brother said that, you know what? She's dead. So you can shoot her and whatever, what do I do? We talk to our lawyers. But anyway, she was shot. And then she was taken again to Bagram. She was there treated and in the same oozing condition she was flown to the US and over there she was then indicted and charged for attempt to murder. She is the one who was shot but the charges against her were attempt to murder US personnel, two FBI agents, three US marshals, two in Two interpreters. Now here's the thing that I don't understand. Do you all remember the OJ case? OJ Simpson. Right? He was acquitted because a glove didn't fit. Right? Here, Afia is a US graduate, MIT graduate. Those are English speaking people. Where are the interpreters? They don't fit. You know, why and do they she's need all interpreters? Of, and she's all of four feet. 
how many, 11 she's, inches? She's two inches short. Uh, and she's all of 100 pounds in weight. And these, these, these US soldiers are, are, you know, hulking big sort of... They're trained in weaponry and they, she snatches a gun six, from them, six, a rifle, six, six an M4 inches. rifle which has security catches. 200 She pounds. opens up the thing, she open fires in this crowded room with all these people, she misses completely, and then she in turn gets shot by the interpreter. Uh, and uh, then she's taken and then she's charged for attempting to shoot U.S. Army personnel, count one, to, uh, to shoot uh, p uh, army personnel, one, two, and then uh, uh, interpreters, the Afghans, and that. So the, there were seven charges, and all of them were this, one, two, three, and then possession of a deadly weapon, and then, you know, use of a deadly weapon. So that's, those were the charges. Nowhere, nowhere was she charged of any crime of terrorism. My question then was, my question now was, you picked her up in 2003, from 2003 to 2008. She was not allowed, we were not allowed to talk about that. No lawyers. No lawyers were allowed to even bring that period in court. And then that aside, there were no fingerprints found on the gun. There were, the gun, the forensic report says the gun was never fired. Yet she is convicted. It's their, they were complicit. I don't know what they have to hide. I, I don't know what they have to hide. Um, I don't know. But what I do know is, yes, the Pakistani government was involved because when Apia's case, when the HRCP brought about his case, it was it was to be heard the very day our chief the, the our chief justice was thrown out of power by our dictator um, just on Friday and Monday he was to hear Apia's case. What was during the entire trial? Let alone the trial. Everyone who attended the trial is witness. My brother was there and. When he asked, after 86 years, she was sentenced to 86 years in solitary confinement in FMC Carswell. That's where you must have, a lot of you must have heard of Lynn Stewart. Lynn Stewart has been sentenced there too. But Afi is in the SD, SDU, the Special uh, Detention detention Unit. Um, it's supposed to be very bad. It's known as the House of Horrors. You would know better than... I would, but um, for us not knowing is worse than what's going on. Because when you don't know, you speculate, you imagine, and imaginations run wild. When you don't know and you get like only 15 minutes after you rally, after you do all kinds of stuff, then you know, you think, and you hear rumors, you hear rumors of death, you hear rumors of rape, you hear rumors of uh, pregnancy, you hear rumors of cancer. You don't know what's true. All you beg for them is that at least can we have an independent set of doctors? Can we have, at least can we do an appeal with lawyers of our choice? No, the same court appointed attorneys that have repeatedly been fired are the ones that are going to put in the appeal. I mean, one of the best grounds of the appeal, one of the best grounds of the appeal, you know, she didn't have the representation of her choice. In 2003, when she was kidnapped, that very time, the kids were removed from her. She was tortured. We were offered, we were offered a plea bargain. We plead she's guilty. She did that. Afia would be free. They said, we'll sentence her for seven years. And uh, which is for attempted murder, that's the usual thing. And then, you know, she's already spent more than that in the ground, and she would come home. But she's innocent, we can't plead guilty. We didn't. And we got 86 years. In solitary confinement, and when my brother asked the judge that can I, at least this one time before you're condemning her to, can I at least meet my sister and give her a hug? That too was denied. These are simple humanitarian things. My mother is sick, and all she wants is, can I please talk to my daughter? My brother, I mean, Eid is our festival. It's like Christmas. We can't even get a phone call on that. My brother sits outside the prison, and they say, I mean, with an order, that he can meet her for eight hours in the weekend. 
He takes those orders, they look at the paperwork, they look at that, they say, yes, sir, you are allowed to meet her, she's allowed to meet you, but we are not allowed to let you to meet. Now what do we do? You know, he, the guard, quote unquote, says, sorry, sir, the normal rules do not apply to your sister. Those are the words that he used. And uh, uh, my brother's friend Andy was with him, and he's witness to that, and he's the one who told me these sort of things. But, I mean, these are cross violations of simple, hum basic human rights. And she is entitled to a Quran. We are Muslims, and, uh, you know, um, we don't wear the veil or cover, of, but we do wear a scarf. And uh, she's not even allowed that. She's not even allowed a Quran. Her Quran was put in a brown box, and there is the story of the brown box, which is our emotional feelings when we got that brown when my mom saw the little food stuff that we would mail there, they didn't just throw it away. They put it in a brown box and sent it back to us, including her Quran. And her scarf, torn up, was all in a brown box, sent back to us. I mean, seeing that and feeling that and looking at the Quran, I mean, that was the only thing that would give her a little solace and solitary confinement. At least, what kind of solitary confinement is this? But even, and you know, for anyone who's a mother, but we all have mothers, and we all know that there's one thing that every mother in every culture has in common, and that is, have my kids eaten food? You know, have you eaten? Whenever you go, however old you may become, you know, your mother's going to ask, have you eaten? And when she saw that food, that's the first time I saw my mom really break and cry. And... But the thing is, she's sentenced to 86 years. The appeal has no chance of anything. I mean, 86 years for a crime she didn't commit, for a crime that wasn't possible. What do we do? I, I, brought, I bring this flight in front of you because you're humanitarians who care, who thought of the people who were suffering in the drone attacks. And you came here because you felt their pain. I want you to look into the case Look into the case of my sister. Go on the internet when you go there. You'll find thousands and thousands of pages of information. There's hearsay, there's innuendo. Supporters raise her to the level of sainthood. Whereas, you know, detractors <coughs> put her down to the level of demonhood. But whatever, for me, she's just my little sister. And mm -hmm. she's just basically a mother of three children. The three children were kidnapped with her and after that, two we have been able to locate, but one child is still missing, the baby. But apparently she wasn't letting go of the baby. When we came into the airport at 2.30 this morning, we were met by a crowd of Afia's supporters oh, who cheered our, our coming here. And, um, uh, and the children were kidnapped too, and pretty much uh, they didn't get access to the children for a long time. You know. My only question to the American ambassador would be that what worse torture can there be separating a mother from her children? You don't have to beat a mother or anything. This is the worst thing you can do. Making her believe that her children are being tortured, even if maybe they're not. But just this, I think this is the worst form of human coercion that anybody could. Anyone who's a mother can feel that. Anyone who's a sister could feel that. Those innocent children, what did they do? Why were they locked up? They asked me that question. I don't have an answer. They're American citizens by birth. They asked me that. I, I don't want them to grow up in hate. I don't want them to grow up in resentment. I want them to be proud of their heritage, both heritages. And I don't have the answers um, to these questions, but please. Well, I mean, we have followed the case of your sister, and most of us, well, I haven't done anything, and meeting you and now being committed. So, Joe, I know that UNAC and, and several other organizations have really been trying to raise the profile of a uh, uh, for uh, case, what can 
from us right here, are there some suggestions of specific things, that say, in the next six months that we can do to help? Visits uh, and phone calls are going to be one thing that we need to put pressure on the government. We're going to try to get her in the country and do a tour so people will know. And uh, she can probably tell you some other details. There's a petition also that we have online. Well, what about the issue of these uh, uh, lawyers, that the, the court will not let you appoint your own lawyers for her defense? Well, is, is, surely there's something we can do about that. And, and then there's the appeal pending in the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, we've got our case running in the Pakistani Supreme Court, but they don't have jurisdiction in the U.S. Court. And another thing that I think you could raise your voices on is that she was kidnapped by the Pakistani intelligence agency, ISI. Then she was kidnapped into, from one country to another country. That, so one crime, one law broken, her kidnapping by the Pakistani ISI.